Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today is the distinguished author, physician, psychiatrist, educator, Dr. David Hamburg, who for a decade and a half presided over one of our nation's most prestigious philanthropic institutions, the Carnegie Corporation. Now, Dr. Hamburg has spoken here before about his twin interests in the healthy development of our children and in the development of world peace that he pursued at Carnegie. In both areas, he has emphasized prevention as a means of avoiding what he calls rotten outcomes. Indeed, along with the late Cyrus Vance, once America's Secretary of State, my guest co-chaired the Distinguished Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict. And now Dr. Hamburg has written his own personal approach to the Commission's work, evocatively titled no more killing fields. We record this program, of course, on April 9th, 2002. And though we can't begin to guess whether deadly conflict and still more killing fields will or will not continue to mar the day you watch and listen to us as they do this day, we still can hope that Dr. Hamburg and his colleagues will have already made real progress in identifying how prevention, and negotiation may ultimately keep us from self-destruction. Indeed, in No More Killing Fields, my guest mentions conversations about these matters with our mutual friend, the late Dr. Jonas Sork of Sork Vaccine fame. And I want to ask Dr. Hamburg today how large a role the training they both received as physicians may have played in developing a mutual interest in immunization in international conflict through the preventive medicine of negotiation. In truth, my question to him is whether this aspect of the medical model is a plus in looking at the killing fields around us. Is that a fair question? I, yes, it is, and I, I think it is. Cy Vance thought it was, too, and his opinion means much more. And many of the scholars and practitioners associated with the commission and its many, many publications and inquiries in international meetings have felt in general that this was a useful orientation. Uh, with respect to Jonas specifically, uh, I have the highest regard for him. I was fortunate to count him as a friend. Uh, I was working with the care of patients um, who had some very severe polio in the 1950s in a, in a very fine unit that the University of Illinois had at that time. And during that period, uh, the vaccine became available. And it was so vividly poignant because then a dollar's worth of vaccine was more than millions of dollars we were spending on the iron lungs and so on. And uh, I didn't know him then. Of course, he did the heavy lifting. He created the vaccine. All I did was to, to appreciate the significance, the profound impact of, uh, of prevention in a situation that was otherwise desperate. And it was, in a way, from killing fields with polio to, uh, to productive lives. And the main reaction of, the, of those who were parents in, in my patients was, well, thank God for my children. And I hope that the message that I'm trying to get across in this meeting, in, in this book, may be thank God for our children and our grandchildren if these kinds of principles and practices can be pursued. And your guess about the value of negotiation here 
uh, the value of vaccinating us against uh, our self-destruction? Well, I, I, this is, we do take in the commission a, a, a very comprehensive approach, and, and forgive me to take, if I take a moment to sort Please of back do. off and say what was the framework. The, uh, I had worked on these matters intensively um, throughout the Cold War and was in a very fortunate position uh, to be able to get some insights and do some useful things during that time in a non-governmental way, uh, at least in the sense that I was based in a non-governmental organization. Uh, uh, now, uh, and of course, Cy Vance uh, was uh, directly involved in a governmental way during some part of that time, and of course, and also he made a huge contribution to the first Camp David before, during, and after the Camp David. It was a long, hard process. And he had also been sent into some very difficult situations, given a very weak hand by his government or by the UN. Go in, Cy, and do a miracle and get us out of this thing, Nagorno-Karabakh or Croatia or Bosnia and so on. So uh, we, we, we did come to feel that, that um, there was a, a usefulness to it. But when you think about the public health approach, it requires a lot of things. It requires a lot of research, for example, to develop a vaccine. Once you get it, you stick it in, it's simple, but, but to figure out how to do it, as we're now seeing with AIDS over the last 10 years, to figure out how to do it is very difficult. So there's, there are institutions of research that contribute mightily, but it takes them a while to do so. At the same time, you must have institutions that take the research and are able to apply it. And in the main, that's either our medical profession in a more traditional sense or the institutions of public health in a larger sense, state and city public health departments and so on. And then you also need, in the case of, the, uh, uh, of cigarettes, to jump to that prevention, uh, the media played a very large role. For there were a number of years in which the media did much more than the physicians did to to publicize the damage done by cigarettes and the, and the desirability of getting off cigarettes. Um, and then the behavioral scientists came in with techniques that helped you to get off cigarettes. All I'm saying is there are a number of pivotal institutions that play a role um, and that, that are salient to the task at hand and, and can, if they wish and if they're adequately supported, uh, prevent the rotten outcomes in, in diseases. And I give some examples of that early in the book. And so too, in preventing deadly conflict, we decided that governments are still important and intergovernmental organizations, especially the UN, is still important. Um, but it's not enough. If it had been enough, we would not have had the catastrophes of the 20th century, the bloodiest centuries in, in all, a century in all of, of history, mainly in the first half of the century, but there was plenty to be done later as well. It was terrible. So we, we then extended the range of pivotal institutions, and it's, I think it's well accepted now. It wasn't so well accepted when we first started. Um, and that is uh, the institutions of civil society. And we interpret that quite broadly. We include the media and the business community and the scientific community and the education community. Uh, and the religious institutions and non-governmental gov non institutions that focus on conflict like the Carter Center, say, probably the best known one. Uh, and uh, so we say all of those institutions have a role to play. And, 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 and I've tried to give in the book um, examples from each one, positive examples. Uh, there aren't a lot. <laughs> there are a lot of negative examples, but there are some positive examples. And I choose the positive examples deliberately, not to be Pollyannish, but to say, if it happens once, it can happen again. We can learn from the positive examples. But my point is simply that in this, in my book particularly, uh, I reach out into a range of pivotal institutions that goes far beyond the traditional ones. I think traditional diplomacy is fine, done by governments on a bilateral basis. Many good things have happened, many bad things have happened, but clearly it has not been enough historically to do what needs doing now. David, let me ask whether these, uh, these means that you conjure up, uh, whether they are peculiar to 
endemic to only democracies or whether you think you can see the construction of such means, of such institutions in non-democratic They nations. largely pertain to democracies, but to some extent they, they pertain uh, beyond democracies. Uh, we, we supported, Carnegie supported during my presidency, a, a major study by scholars primarily at UCLA on the question of what they call the grand coalition, which would be the established democracies, plus particularly Russia and China. Russia may or may not be a democracy one of these days. I think it's edging toward it, and China's edging toward it too, but at a much slower rate. Um, but, but on the whole, I think this is a task for the established democracies, which of course is an expanding community. But um, let, let me say about this, just, uh, there's, a, there's such a basic point for me that I shouldn't take it for granted. You know, I, I'm, I'm very delighted to be on this program because it, it, it's such a thoughtful and serious program over the years. And one of the things that has struck me, uh, you recently sent me the, the volume that you and Ellie Wiesel did on the whole series of interviews that, uh, that Ellie had done with you. And what's so important about that is Ellie has, of course, magnificently documented the Holocaust, whatever else he's done. And, and I'm saying in this book, we are in a world still predisposed to Holocaust-like situations as the large-scale killing of people just because they're people, because they have some identification or other. And in any case, the, the, the capacity for mass slaughter is actually greater now than it's ever been. You mean Part, our ability to, yeah, our to ability create to do killing it. fields? Partly because there are lots more weapons partly because many of the weapons are even conventional weapons are more destructive than they used to be, and, um, and partly because the capacity to incite violence is so much greater with all the, the techniques of the telecommunications world. So you can incite violence and, and the hatred, uh, you can do much more damage, and there are all kinds of cleavage lines that exist in the world, ethnic or religious or nationalistic or whatever, and therefore, I'm saying that in the next, in, in this century, as we go along, that it's, we cannot take war as a sort of naturally occurring phenomenon. It has to be expected like, like wind or snow or even blizzards and tornadoes and, and, and so forth. It's, it's, Why um, do you say we can't? What do you mean by that? I, I mean that it's so dangerous and it could mean actually the extinction of humanity. I mean that much. There was a debate during the Cold War when we were at a, at a very close point to a nuclear war in the scientific community about whether a full-scale nuclear war would eliminate humanity altogether or whether maybe it would leave a small ring in the southern hemisphere. Maybe, ironically, apartheid South Africa would escape the radiation effects. But the total, the various effects were such that there was a serious question whether humanity could survive. That's quite a debate to have. Now, we're not in the Cold War. Now, on the other hand, if you look ahead two or three decades, we could get into a multipolar situation in which multiple countries had weapons of mass destruction, some of which were much less responsible than others. Even we and the Russians learned something about how to become responsible with each other. I was involved in that, the crisis prevention approach. But uh, I, I don't know that, uh, that, that, that all the nations would have weapons of mass destruction are going to be responsible. Furthermore, the killing in the 1990s, large-scale killing. I mean, look, in, in Rwanda, it was roughly speaking one in 10 people about in a few months' time. And that was so-called light weapons, light weapons. But even the light weapons and small arms are more destructive than they used to be and much more widely available. The world is plastered with so-called light weapons. So I'm, I'm saying that, that I think we can't afford to be placid or take it as a phenomenon of nature anymore because um, at best, if we go the path that we've been on, uh, there'll be very little uh, decency to live for. Wow. That's all I can say when you, when you finish saying that. And it's strange for me to hear that from you because no more killing fields when I first understood the title, when I first knew what your title was, I thought, well, that's David Hamburg. It's that goodness in that man. Please, no more killing fields. Do uh, you think there will be more? I'm not asking you now whether we're going to destroy ourselves if there are more killing fields. Well, I think there will be more killing fields. I, the, the, in the very beginning of this, 
uh, I, I say, and I should, I should say that I'm freer to speak for myself in this than the commission was. Furthermore, the commission sponsored uh, the widest array of prevention-relevant material ever generated to my knowledge. There are 75 reports, monographs, and books that have been put out by the commission to try to get around the contours of this very complex uh, problem and, and very necessarily comprehensive approach. And, uh, and I try to draw on all that. I can't make a grand synthesis, but try to illuminate the potentially strongest pillars of prevention uh, for the future. And I say uh, the time in which it has to be measured is at best decades and probably generations. And, and I, I hope by the end of this century, we'll be at a point where it will be virtually impossible to have more killing fields. But I think in the next few decades, if we take you know, the, sort of the Cambodian am analogy, uh, that there will unfortunately be other killing fields. You say virtually impossible. Impossible on what level? In what way? Because we will have structured uh, negotiations, preventive action in such a way that it just won't happen? Yes, we will have structured a system so far reaching uh, in its effects that it will greatly diminish the likelihood of of large-scale armed conflicts. Now, does I that presuppose, David, if I may interrupt, yeah, sure. does that presuppose the domination of the rest of the world by a few democracies that can uh, think in these terms, that have the ability and the willingness to do so? Uh, I would much prefer that it be the community of the enlarging community of, of democracies. So it would be, of course, <laughs> the familiar. Uh, West European and American and Canadian, etc. Uh, but uh, of course, also now Japan, also more and more Eastern Europe, uh, India, of course, South Africa. It's an expanding community, <laughs> and I hope that it would continue to expand. Now, let me say that's an important part of what this book is about. I say more than the Commission was able to say on this subject. It isn't just negotiation. Negotiation and mediation, third-party intervention, deals with, with already when there's tension building pretty strongly or even you're close to a crisis or close to the brink. And that's important. And the earlier we had done, the better. The more skillfully we done, the better. That's important. That's what we call preventive diplomacy. And the Commission sponsored a lot of new work, genuinely new research. It's almost, a, it's roughly analogous to the, some of the immunological research that made made the vaccines possible. And it, it tells a lot about uh, how early and how well to do and uh, preventive diplomacy. That's fine. But, but I also say that fundamentally you need systems within countries and in regions that are capable of dealing with grievances, that are capable of, of, of meeting basic human needs. Uh, and and so I basically am saying you need international cooperation for democratic development. And I mean democratic development in both the political sense and the economic sense. You need Marx-based economies with appropriate regulations so they don't run wild. And you need democratic institutions, including very strong civil societies. Why? Because those two taken together, and I think they belong together, provide the best opportunity that we have for people everywhere to feel reasonably satisfied, not to build tremendous grievances. If they do build strong grievances, there are mechanisms readily available. Look, in a democracy, you not only have an independent judiciary and all of that, but you also have habits of negotiation and mutual accommodation that, that develop even from childhood. So you learn that things, yeah, there's a give and take and there's a compromise, and that informal part is, is perhaps as important as the formal. But, it is, I do try to make a strong case for, for international cooperation for democratic development. Why international cooperation? Because nobody can do it alone, not even the U.S. and certainly not the U.N. Those are two important constituents, but it needs to be quite extensive. And as I say, I hope it will get more extensive with more democracies to contribute. You know, here in the book I, I get this notion that it is the fairness, the essential fairness that is characteristic of democracy. Mm -hmm. that looms so large in this matter, in yes, your it, thinking. Yes, if I had to have a bumper sticker, one of my bumper stickers would be a culture of fairness. 
That would be one of my bumper stickers, fairness in all aspects of life within countries and between peoples to the, to the maximum extent possible. The dignity of every human being, what we now mean by human rights. Uh, that, that's the core of it, and, and, and the only way I know to develop and protect for the long term uh, that outlook is through, is through democratic institutions. I said to begin with, I don't know what our viewers are going to be living with when they see what we're saying today, but we know what we're living with. Uh, what's your sense of the possibility of containing the struggles that um, come before September 11th? But perhaps let's focus on what is going on in the Middle East and on. Well, let me say first September that the, 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 the September 11th was a, a great, huge stimulus which could paradoxically uh, do a lot of good in the world. It may or may not. But it, it brings home the very fundamental realization that anybody anywhere can do immense damage, no matter for people near or far, that we have a situation which is unprecedented. And it doesn't have to take in intercontinental missiles, not at all. They can bring in a, a, a nuclear weapon, say, on a ship or a van. Uh, there's so many ways. We needn't go into it. But um, that. That is fundamental, and September 11th brought that home, certainly to us, as it never has been, and I think to much of the world. And that could happen anywhere. The, the Russians know they could have uh, a, a nuclear weapon in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg set off, and the Brits know it could be in London, and the French know it could be Paris, and so on. Uh, so that this is, and certainly the Indians, from their experience, they know it could be Delhi, it could be whatever. Uh, in their conflict. So all over the world, everybody is vulnerable, and, and I think this, this awareness uh, was reflected in the shock people felt and the initial cooperation the United States got in responding to it. It was sort of there, but for the grace of God, go I. All right, that's one thing. Now, uh, that can be a stimulus, and I, have a, I, I, I added a chapter, it was scattered before, but I added a chapter before going to publication called Preventing Catastrophic Terrorism, in order to make it clear some of the lessons, at least, that grow out of, of that experience. But now you, you come to the Middle East. The Middle East is a perfect case for prevention. So is Northern Ireland. Um, we have these dreadful situations that go on and on and on for decades where early on nobody thinks about prevention. It's, it's out of the question. Now, it's true that it was a different world 40 or 50 years ago. We didn't have uh, a lot of the insights and the attitudes and the machinery and the institutions that can to some degree help us with prevention. We didn't have that then. We had some. I have a, I have a chapter in here is, you know, could World War II and the Holocaust have been prevented? I got wonderful help from great historians like Gordon Craig of Stanford and Fritz Stern of Columbia to try to figure that out. And my old med, uh, mentor, Fritz Redlick from Yale, was very helpful in that. And I conclude, yes, even with the limited tools they had available, they could have prevented. Winston Churchill thought that. But certainly with today's tools, they could. But this, the Middle East thing, uh, it goes on and on. Uh, one personal example, very small, uh, it occurred to me after the Six-Day War, when the Israelis had proven their courage and their ability, and the old stereotype of Jews as, as weak and fearful and, and inevitably crushed, and in the immediate wake of the Holocaust, what is Israel? It's the remnant of the Holocaust. I mean, it has other meanings, but it's operationally, it's the remnant of the Holocaust. Well, I went over there and talked to some people. I had no authority then. That was before I was with Carnegie, and I was a doctor, an academic scientist. What did I know? But I did, I did have some feeling for it. And essentially what I said, paraphrasing Churchill and others, in victory magnanimity, the Six-Day War was brilliant. Now you have an opportunity to lay out a piece. You don't even have to start from scratch. Uh, you know there's a lot of animosity towards you, and in some ways even more after you won. But nevertheless, uh, your, your enemies know that you're very powerful. You're in a very strong position. You could probably get a lot of world backing. Lay out the essential elements of a peace plan and get some backing from the United States and others to help uh, work it out. Might have failed. But it was preventive thinking. It wasn't primary prevention in a medical sense. There had already been several wars. But it was secondary prevention in the sense that you hadn't yet reached the kind of catastrophic war, which God knows what might, might result. Uh, so what, what I'm saying is we chose here not to deal with what's in the, the inbox of foreign ministries about today's conflicts. 
many of them reflect failures of prevention. The whole Yugoslavia thing I could go into in great detail because I was involved, but um, it, it was very late in the day that people began even to think about prevention in Yugoslavia, let alone act on it. So these things, awful as they are, have to be a stimulus to us to say, we've got to do better than that. And, and let's look at David Hamburg's book and see if it's, uh, it, it can help us. By the way, I want to emphasize the intention of my book, like the intention of the commission, was to stimulate better ideas, to get it out there where people would read and think about it, at least begin to think preventively. And undoubtedly, there'll be better ideas. David, what in the history of mankind gives you basis any basis for hoping that this can take place? Well, not much, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, in my lifetime, the second half of the 20th century, we have seen some remarkable things, Dick, uh, that do provide some basis for hope. Uh, we look at how the United States responded after World War II. It, it seems so obvious now. It wasn't obvious then. When, when Marshall proposed the Marshall Plan at his Harvard commencement, such polling as there was in those days, as I understand it, never got up to 10% support in the early months. American people, when the war was over, fine, let's get out of there. And we demobilized rapidly and so forth. Uh, Marshall and Truman and Atchison and others uh, got out. Let me exaggerate. They didn't miss a Rotary Club or a Kiwanis Club in the country. I mean, they, they campaigned for this. And for four years, we spent about 1% of our gross national product. Not such a big deal, and it made it a, a transforming influence on Europe. Now, moreover, the concept was that Europeans would play a very active part in formulating it. They wouldn't be the passive recipients or wouldn't have it imposed on them. They would, they would use their brains and their ideals with us. They would have to meet democratic standards. They would have to meet free market standards. But within certain guidelines, um, they would go a long way to develop it. We would develop it jointly. But anyhow, the Marshall Plan and NATO and the emergence gradually of the European Union, which began back in that period, you have a set of institutions in Europe that stand very strongly for democracy, for, for human rights. You look at the way we treated Germany, Japan, and Italy. They're vigorous democracies today. There are a lot of things like that that give me some hope. You have hope. I have hope that you will come back again and continue this because there's too much here that has to be unraveled. But thank you very much for joining me today thank on The you. Open Thank you. It's Mind. a privilege to be with you, Dick. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or a money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.